Welcome to part two of History of the Atom. In this video, we're going to be exploring the structure of the atom and connecting some of the landmark discoveries that were made uh, to how they influenced what we know about the structure of the atom. To recap where we left off with, we so far know that from Dalton's five points of his atomic theory uh, that the model of the atom is a solid sphere uh, that has no features. Almost a hundred years later, J.J. Thompson, a physicist, uh, was performing experiments with cathode rays. And he studied cathode rays with a device called a Crookes tube, which looks like this. Now a Crookes tube, we're going to talk about very quickly how it works and uh, then what he learned from the Crookes tube. So basically in this tube, this space in between, uh, was filled with a small amount of gas. And here and here we could hook this up to a power source, okay, so some voltage source. And these two voltage sources would be connected to one metal plate on this end and one metal plate on this end. And when you connect the power source, an electric current generates a cathode ray from one plate to the other. Now this beam could be manipulated by a number of things. Uh, if you put a magnet, if you put a magnet on one end, the beam would bend towards it if you put the positive end of the magnet there. If you instead put the negative end of the magnet here, you'd see the beam bend away from it. The second thing you can figure out from the Crookes tube is that if it's a complete vacuum in the chamber, this beam can't form. There has to be some gas in there to get this cathode ray to extend across. Another thing he could do is put an object in the middle of the beam's path and he would see a shadow over here in the shape of that object. So through all this, he discovers the electron. And he says electrons are very small particles that have both a mass and a negative charge. So in Thomson's model, the atom is still a solid mass, just like it is in Dalton's. It's a solid mass. Uh, but now there are tiny electrons scattered all the way through this atom. Okay? And these electrons are all significantly smaller than the atom, and they all have a negative charge. So the other thing he added was that this solid mass had to have a positive charge to balance out all the tiny negative charges of the electrons. Um, he sort of called it, because he was British, uh, the plum pudding model. That was a pretty common dessert. Um, but it's not something we really eat, so I like to call this the chocolate chip model, because it looks like a chocolate chip cookie. Now the electrons in this chocolate chip model are not just stuck in there. They're actually on uh, rotating rings, and they're constantly moving throughout this solid mass. Ten years later, after Thomson's model, another scientist, Robert Milliken, uh, conducts a really, really cool oil drop experiment. Oil drop experiment. And I'm going to go over this experiment in greater detail uh, at the end of this lesson. So you can keep watching the video at the end uh, to see some of the details for that experiment. Um, but for our purposes right now, in the main video, uh, his major contribution was that he discovered the actual charge of the electron, and from that, the actual mass of the electron. A few years after Milliken, a scientist named Ernest Rutherford finds some amazing, amazing discoveries. So Rutherford is a huge deal. And uh, we're going to sort of map out what his experiment is and uh, how it led to some amazing advances in atomic theory. So, what was Rutherford doing? Well, Rutherford was interested in radioactivity and he was doing a lot of research around that. So let's look at what his actual experiment entailed. Basically, Rutherford had a lead box and he set up a circular detector screen around it like that. Now, there was a small hole in this lead box, and inside the lead box he placed a radioactive source. And that radioactive source uh, emitted something called alpha particles. Okay? Alpha particles. This little symbol here is the lowercase Greek letter alpha. And alpha particles are relatively large compared to a normal atom. They're relatively large positive particles. So the hole in the lead box is there to allow these alpha particles to exit in a straight line. Okay? And if they're allowed to keep going, they should all hit in a straight line directly 
right here on this indicate on this detector. Now what Rutherford did was he put a piece of very thin, very thin gold foil uh, in the path of this beam of alpha particles, and this stream of alpha particles. And he expected them to go right through. And let's take a look at why he expected that. So, so here we have uh, the expected model of the atom and why he thought everything was going to go right through. We have a picture of Thomson's model right here. Uh, you can these black lines going through are the alpha particles and you can see they're going straight through the atom without really hitting any resistance. An analogy for what Rutherford expected to see uh, was that he was basically shooting a cannonball at a piece of tissue paper. The cannonball should go right through. Now instead, Rutherford saw something remarkably different. So now I'm going to use a different color here to show what actually happened. We have our stream of alpha particles exiting the lead box. Now most of them do go straight through and hit where they were expected to hit. But some of them ended up scattering, meaning we got a couple hits off on the side here, some of them bounced back. Okay, we got this sort of scatter, this random scattering pattern for a very, very small number of these alpha particles. But this circular detector screen still picked them up. So Rutherford was shocked. I mean, he was basically shooting a cannonball at a piece of tissue paper, and that tissue paper was knocking around those cannonballs. So something had to be going on. Rutherford was actually able to come up with an explanation for why the scattering was happening. So let's take a look at that explanation. We have sort of an updated model here. You can see the atom has now this strange little core in the center of it. And now most of the black lines that represent the alpha particles are going right through. But you can see a couple that go a little too near this core are getting bounced around. So let's go over his explanation in greater detail. The first part of the explanation is this little core right here. Now Rutherford said that the entire mass of this atom is actually contained primarily in this tiny little core at the center of it and that's called a nucleus. Okay, So the nucleus, he said, is a very dense core that contains most of the atom's mass and all of its positive charge. Okay, So we have a positively charged nucleus. So that leads the question, what about the rest of the atom? And that's the rest of his explanation. The reason the alpha particles went straight through the rest of the atom is that the rest of the atom is mainly empty space. Empty space. And this is radically different from what we've had before. Okay? Before, it was a solid mass. Now Rutherford is saying it's mostly empty space. And it's got this tiny, tiny nucleus in the center of it. To give you an idea of the scale we're talking about of empty space, if you can imagine the uh, entire atom is a football stadium, okay? the nucleus would be the size of a basketball at the 50-yard line. In that same stadium analogy, electrons would be the size of pins in the bleachers. Rutherford said that the electrons inhabited the empty space, but he didn't really offer much more explanation than that. He sort of adopted Thomson's idea of the electrons moving around on rotating rings. So moving on from Rutherford, we get a few more details, and we're going to wrap up this timeline for now. There is actually more to this, but here's where we're going to end for this video. In 1917, Rutherford discovers the proton uh, using a nuclear reaction that we're going to talk about later in our nuclear chemistry unit. A few years later, in 1921, he actually theorized that there must be an uncharged mass in the nucleus as well, and he called them neutrons. Neutrons aren't technically discovered until 1932 uh, by a guy named James Chadwick, and Chadwick was also working with radioactivity. So here we have a sort of view of Rutherford's model. Uh, you can see that it's no longer a solid sort of edge of this atom because it's all empty space. We can see the core is right here, a positively charged core with all these protons in it. These little plus signs are protons, and they form the nucleus in the center. And here we have the electrons hanging out in the empty space. And again, they're moving on rotating rings, so you can sort of imagine each one has this little ring that it's rotating on. Thanks for watching History of the Atom Part 2. We've gone now from Democritus all the way through Rutherford's model of the atom. If you're interested, you should keep watching to see some details on Millikan's oil drop experiment. Otherwise, make sure to write down any questions from this lesson and bring them in with you to class. All right, here we have a model of Millikan's oil drop experiment. Let's explain what's going on here. First, we have a chamber right here. And in this chamber, you have a little device that sprays oil into it. So here we have all the little oil particles. The next thing I want to point out is that there are two plates 
here and here that are hooked up to a power source. And that power source creates a big electric field between them. Now what happens is in this chamber, the oil gets ionized, it means it gets a charge. And when the little oil particle gets a charge, it can fall through this hole and it'll get caught in the electric field. Now how does this happen? Well, gravity is acting on every one of these oil particles. So if we look at this oil particle, gravity is constantly acting on it, pulling it downwards. But if it has a charge to it, if it's in this electric field, the electric field can be pulling up on it. So now we see the microscope over here and the person looking through the microscope into this space between the two plates. What they'll see is the oil drop, instead of falling all the way down to the bottom plate, will actually start to rise up with the electric field because the electric field is overcoming the pull of gravity. Because this person is actually watching the droplet and we know what the distance between the two plates is, we can actually measure how quickly the oil drop is rising. Once we know that, we're able to calculate what the charge is on that oil drop. And Millikan was able to use this to figure out the charge of an electron. Once he knew the charge of an electron, he could figure out the mass of an electron based on Thomson's work.